On this first ever panel episode of the creator community, we'll meet three authors, Gene Hull, Sam Perez, and Rick Roth. Each author has a brand new book out that explores the meaning and power of legacy that they share through various genres. We'll learn about each of their journeys as authors, what role legacy plays in their lives, and why this concept is so important to each of them. We'll hear how they all found and connected with their legacy and what they hope readers will take away from their books. All three offer ideas to reflect on to help you consider your longer term goals and what you want to leave behind. We'll follow the journey that led each author to find the passion to publish their new books and share how their books have dramatically changed their lives. Check out the show. Welcome to the Creator Community. This is a podcast from book publisher New Degree Press, or NDP. I'm your host, John Saunders. This show is designed to celebrate, elevate, and showcase many of the incredible authors that have published their books with NDP. This year, NDP will cross over 1,500 published authors from six continents and earn the 293rd spot on the Inc. 5000 list. This is the fastest growing privately held companies in America. If you've ever thought of writing your book but weren't sure where to start or finish, visit creator.institute to learn more. Today's a special episode for season five. We have three authors with us in a panel discussion. Gene Hull, Sam Perez, and Rick Roth. And today we're going to talk about not only their amazing new books and their journeys, but a key theme that permeates each of their books, which is legacy. Gene, Sam, Rick, great to see you. Welcome to the show. Thanks Thank you, John. Much. Such a fun, fun time to get to get all of you here together for a chat for us to really share on this deep, deep topic. But before we go there, I want to just have each of you share a little bit more about your education and career journey and how it all led led all of you to writing your book. And Gene, I want to start with you and just share a quick bio for folks and get a little bit more about your background. So Gene Hull is a mother, wife, veteran, uh, and veteran who has dabbled in the fields of history, international relations, counterinsurgency, and information technology. After graduating from West Point, Gene was commissioned as a military intelligence officer. She subsequently deployed to Bosnia, Iraq, South Korea, and she merged her experiences with academic research while completing her doctorate at Princeton University. Jean, quite a background. Please tell us more. Well, thanks, John. <laughs> so the, the whole book transition story really begins in my childhood, where I was always an avid reader and a consumer of books and fiction in particular and science fiction in particular. Fast forward, I left the active duty army in 2012, shortly after I had gotten married. And then close on the heels of that, I had a child and my, and then I had a subsequent identity crisis of, you know, leaving the army, being a mother, being a wife and trying to figure out what my identity actually was. And the course of trying to figure that out, I went through several career transitions. And then in 2019, when I was trying to pivot into the tech sector, I went to a certification course. And during the icebreaker exercise, I blurted out, I'm a closeted novelist. I didn't know where that came from, but it felt really true. And I decided to explore that new avenue from there. Gene, when you blurted out that statement, I want to, I'm a closeted novelist. What, what was the question? The question was, tell us a deep, dark secret about yourself that nobody else knows. I, I say that, you know, that qualifies. I like that. And so you wanted, you wanted to get a book out there. I love it. I'd, I'd love to hear this, uh, this thought from uh, Sam, if you want to go next, but let me first uh, share folks a little bit about your background here. Sam is a television news reporter who loves telling stories. Her passion led her to the University of Georgia, where she graduated with degrees in journalism and Spanish. When not cheering on the dogs, Georgia Bulldogs, or filming news stories, you can find her trying out some new restaurants. This passion for food comes from her parents, who opened DV8, DV8 number eight Kitchen in Lexington, Kentucky. Sam, thanks for jumping on the show here today. So please tell us your story, your background. Huh? What, what, where, how'd you find this journey to writing a book? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much for having me, John. Sure. So I am a journalist. I love telling stories. I've known this is the career path I've wanted since I was in middle school. And then my parents, when they opened that restaurant that you talked about, Deviate Kitchen, it employs people in recovery from substance use disorder or addiction. And it really just opened my eyes to all the awesome stories that they have. So I figured, you know, I love telling stories. I love the mission that DV8 has and the work that my parents are doing. So what better way to share that than by, you know, writing a book on it? 
Wow. So an intersection between sort of passion and, and creativity and having this mission to, to drive you. I know we're going to get into that a lot more later with some of our other questions. So let's, let's, let's get Rick's uh, bio here, but thank you for that, Sam, and, and, and get his thought on it. But Rick Roth is a, a father, husband, and son who enjoys continually learning to improve not just his own life, but the lives of others. He's a highly rated adjunct professor and has taught at New York University and the University of Connecticut. He's also an accomplished real estate financier and investor with over 25 years of industry experience. So very different backgrounds here and how we all mm -hmm. found our way. But Rick, what was your story? How, what, what led you to writing this book here? Well, first, Sean, thanks so much for having me. And I'm so honored to be doing this panel with Gene and, and Sam. It's just great to be here. So yeah, so as you can tell, kind of from my background, you wouldn't think maybe I'd be writing a book. If, we, if I was writing a book, it might be a real estate investment book. But I had a kind of a something inside to have a calling almost to do a book based on this teal journal that was given to me by my grandfather, basically shortly after I buried him. And it really was the book, the journal has a lot of bits of wisdom that he wrote to me, his only grandchild. And in it, you know, it's kind of a message of passing down wisdom. So my book is called the Teal Book of Wisdom and, and the, the, the journal inspired me to do that. Teal Book Wisdom. Teal Book of Wisdom. Yes. Book of, thank you. I love that. And I, I forgot to mention Gene and Sam's books. Gene's book is about uh, Midgard and Sam's book, Deviate from Denial. So these are books all coming out this September 2022, wherever you buy books online. So thank you for giving us a sense of your, your journeys and, and kind of how you all landed here. So let's let's transfer over to Sam here for this one. Sam, how did you find this author coaching program with the Creator Institute and then New Degree Press? Yeah, absolutely. So like I said, I've always loved telling stories and writing a book was always kind of this thought in the back of my mind, but I was never really serious about it until I got a message on LinkedIn. And initially I thought it was, you know, one of those spam recruiters, but then I ended up reading it and learning about New Degree Press. And so that seed was planted. I, you know, wasn't ready to do it. I was a sophomore in college and I thought writing a book seemed like an overwhelming task at that point. But about two years later, when the same person reached out on LinkedIn, that was enough for me to take the deep dive and realize that even though this time I was a senior in college, I, you know, it was a project I wanted to pursue. And so that's how I heard about it. And I could not be more grateful for the journey that I've had. That is fantastic. So somebody reached out, was it Eric? Actually, it was not. It was Jamie. To, I don't know how to say her last name. Jamie Tabasco, I believe. But yeah, she reached out and wanted to connect with other writers that she found on LinkedIn. And, you know, I fit that box. That is outstanding. So the, you know, it's amazing this global world we live in now, right? That we can, you know, sort of navigate through and, and connect with each other on. It's uh, Rick, crazy. Rick, right? Rick, what was your origin story to finding your way to the program? Yeah. So a couple of years ago, I was went for an early morning walk with my friend, Chris Long, who, John, I know you know as Professor Long from Georgetown. And Chris started, we were talking about books and I and book writing. And I had mentioned about my grandfather's Teal Journal and kind of that inspiring me and kind of thinking about writing my own Teal Book of Wisdom to, to my children and to others. And uh, Chris told me about uh, Eric Custer at Georgetown in the class that he teaches. So I emailed Chris and he emailed me back and I was in that uh, Falls cohort of authors and it was just a wonderful experience. I learned so much. And he also had this like wonderful like guest author series of a, a number of really famous authors from like Ariana Huffington to Dan Pink, who just really inspired me. And I, you know, really learned a lot about, about writing, which, which helped me, even though I'm well-educated and I'm an adjunct professor, I had never written a book before. So it was wonderful. That is amazing. So through word of mouth, through a friend that had known about the program and even has dabbled in writing a book himself, I think at some point, Chris, Professor Long, I really enjoyed his leadership class I took when I went through business school. Thank you for sharing right. that, Rick. You're Gene, welcome. what was your story? Thank you. How did you find your way here, Gene? Well, so I like how you refer to it as an origin story, by the way, John, that's fantastic. I 
In the midst of my identity crisis, I decided to pursue professional coaching, which I highly recommend to anybody else who's going through a professional identity crisis in their lives. And my coach, Rachel, after we spoke, talked about values, talked about ideas, talked about things that we were interested in, I told her the story about the icebreaker exercise. And she's like, Jean, you need to start writing. You need to start writing right now. So I started writing. And if it is supposed to be a book, you will have a book. If not, you just need to write. So I didn't even think about it. I just started writing. About six months later, when I had about 80,000 words put together and no idea what to do with them, I reached out to, I was working with Rachel's business partner, Kristen, on a a beta test for an executive coaching seminar. And it turns out Kristen was writing a book. And I was like, really, how did you write a book? And Kristen is the one that linked me up with Eric Custer, who Rick has already mentioned. I had a 15 minute phone call with Eric Custer and I was like, thank you. The universe did intervene. Uh, I must be meant to write this book. And it's been a difficult, but very rewarding experience ever since. That is incredible. So let's let's get into these books. And Rick, I want to start with you here, The Teal Book of Wisdom. What what is this book about? What are readers going to get out of it? Well, it's really about sharing timeless wisdom with those you care about through really interesting and easy to read real life stories. So a favorite quote that I have in the book is Ben Franklin once said, we get old too soon and wise too late. And I'm hoping that the readers and people who read this they might take away a little wisdom and have a life with less less regrets. Wow, living life with less regret. And I love this idea of passing on this wisdom that your grandfather carried around and wanted to share with you. And now you're giving everyone else a chance. You're creating a template, a roadmap for others to do the same for people in their family. That is fantastic. Thank you. Jean, let's jump over to you. What does Midgard about? So Midgard is a novel. It is a piece of fiction. In fact, the first piece of fiction I've ever written. It is science fiction slash dystopian. So imagine a future 100 years from now, if our species does nothing to stop climate change or stop the destruction of its own habitat, how might mankind respond? That's the world that my book is set in. And my main character has to navigate not only the severe weather events, but the civil wars, the insurgencies, the political competition for scarce resources and scarce places to live where humanity can survive. And he will discover a lot of things about himself and about others that he wasn't planning to along the way. Wow. That is a a deep story intersecting so many different themes in the world here. And I love that I've always, I'm all, I don't know what it is I find fascinating about these dystopian future books, but I always find them fascinating. So I can't, I can't wait to read it. Thank you for sharing that. And Sam, let's go over to you. What, what is Deviate from Denial about? Yeah, absolutely. So it started as a book about my parents' experience opening Deviate Kitchen in Lexington and their experience getting to meet people who have experienced substance use disorder or addiction. And, you know, there is the opioid epidemic and it is killing people literally every single day. We have got this huge problem on our hands and it's something we don't talk about enough. Addiction is taboo and it's messy and people don't really want to start the conversation. So deviate from denial is my attempt to do that. It's broken up into three parts. The main kind of crux of it is just sharing stories of people who have either been affected by addiction themselves through their own experience or maybe knew who some knew someone who was affected. So it's just an attempt to get the conversation going and start talking about the issue so that way we can work toward a solution. You know, I find it, thank you so much for sharing that. What a, a powerful message each of you have through your books. And hopefully people are getting a sense of, and we'll tie it together for you a little bit more here in a bit, but a, a sense of why legacy falls into all of their stories, right? There's a legacy of of helping others through addiction and p- pain and suffering. There's a legacy of helping passing wisdom on. There's a legacy of helping make the planet a better place. So I think there's some really interesting threads here on legacy. But Jean, I want to jump over to you on this one and say, you know, what does legacy mean as it relates to you and your book? How, how does that fit into your, your thesis? I think for most people and myself included, the definition of legacy is what we leave behind after we are no longer on this planet. And that's really relevant to my book in a number of ways, not just in the climate space. The way that I think of legacy, I think we leave two types. We can leave tangible 
legacies, we can leave intangible legacies. On the tangible side of the house, you know, one of the legacies our generation will leave behind is the condition the planet is in when we die. For many of us, the legacy we leave behind is our children. Or if we don't have children, it's the people we coach, teach, mentor, and influence. And what they take forward with them ends up being part of our legacy. On the intangible side of the house, what kind of principles and values that we leave with those people that will truly that we'll, we will be measured against after we're, that we're gone? In my book, both types of legacy are explored. Obviously, the environment is the tangible legacy that my characters have inherited from their antecedents. But my protagonist's mother leaves him a very specific legacy, and it is both tangible and intangible. And Sam spends, Sam, my protagonist, will spend the entire book trying to figure out what that legacy is and how to find it. Wow. One, thank you for clarifying that it's Sam from the book, not the Sam on the interview here. Two, you know, when you Google or look up the definition of the word legacy, so often it really attaches to just tangible things, oftentimes money, wills, things like this. So I love that you've delineated it between these these two different elements and that that's such a key thread through your book that the the person is trying to discover it the whole time uh, i love that sam let's jump over to you what does legacy mean to you when it when you think about your book and the work you've done yeah definitely so i think gene touched on you know a really important part of how that relates to me and it's through my parents so you know they have this tangible legacy and i guess that's me and also the work that they do so my book really started as a deep dive into their work and what they do because i have the unique perspective of being their daughter they own this restaurant which then means it's you know a family affair so work talk doesn't stay in the restaurant it comes home it's at the dinner table it was in the car as i learned to drive just my my whole girl up, I was really a big part of what they do. And I got to learn from them. And I mean, I see them impact lives every single day. And it really inspired me. I think the work they're doing is really important. And somewhere along the road, their passion for helping people suffering from addiction and working toward recovery really transferred onto me. It became my own kind of passion. And I realized that, you know, everyone can help in some way or another. So my parents are restaurateurs, they're business people. And so they can help this crisis we're having by opening a restaurant. I'm a journalist. I love telling stories. So I can help by, you know, telling stories, but everyone else has a different way that they can kind of take part in this. So really just sharing my parents' legacy is a huge, huge part of my book and the why behind why I wrote it. Wow. I love that you're celebrating your parents and the work they've done and all these people that are helping through addiction, which of course has become a bigger and bigger problem over the years, particularly with opioids. What was your parents' initial reaction to you writing this book? Oh my gosh. Well, I think they thought I was crazy, first of all. Like I said, I was a senior in college and they're like, oh my gosh, you know, looking for first jobs, doing all the last things that come along with that, moving states. So I think they thought I was a little crazy, but at the same time, I think I get that work ethic from them. So I don't know if they were too surprised. I think they were just happy. That's fantastic. And Rick, clearly legacy is a, a key theme for you and passing on this wisdom from not only you know your own grandfather, but wanting to share it with so many others in your life and your family. So what is how does legacy play a part for you and or have a meaning in your book? Yeah, I think as Gene had said before, there's kind of the tangible and intangible. So my grandfather, fortunately, for the first 22 years of my life, had spent a lot of time with me and cared for me. And then the Teal Journal was something tangible. And unbeknownst to me, he was writing in that journal from the time I was born till his last entry was right before his passing. And again, it was like little bits of wisdom that something tangible that I was able to hold on to. So with my own book, you know, I have some of my own stories because his journal wasn't enough for a book. I have some personal stories, but then I also interviewed over a dozen remarkable people that I've known in my life to kind of carry on kind of timeless lessons and wisdom from some remarkable people too that could be shared with others. And then my goal is I'm really hopeful too, at the end of each chapter, each chapter kind of has a theme or a lesson. I have three open-ended questions and an older reader might be inspired to write their own teal journal to somebody that they care about, like my grandfather did for me. That is awesome. I, I'm, I don't think you were able to ask your grandfather how he feels about this book today, if I recall history correctly. He's passed away now, right? But uh, what, what would you say? Yeah, today, so Brad? I would, you know, I, I started this, you know, it'll be 30 years since his, his passing. Well, 
So yeah. what would what would you say to your grandfather about inspiring you to write this book today? Oh, that uh, you know, I, I I appreciated his wisdom. He wasn't anyone famous, but when he worked at Brookhaven National Labs, he had met people like Einstein and Sir Fleming, who discovered penicillin. So he he was a thinker, and he the ma- most important thing though is the the unconditional love that he showed me and my family and being able to pass that on to other people like my children and family and friends that's really what i would say thank you to him for that is fantastic so it had an impact across so many aspects of your life and as it has been the case for all of you thinking about this legacy and writing the book so let's go a little bit more into our lives and how how we think about legacy and how it plays a role in our life sam you want to you want to start with this one Thank you so much for asking that. So legacy plays a huge role in my life. You know, because Deviate is based on my parents and their work, I've just been able to see everything that they've done. And I've been able to see the legacy that they left. So they're impacting lives every single day. And I've gotten to actually, you know, see kind of a part of that legacy. So there are over 45 people that are employed at Deviate who are working every single day to stay sober, who are in these recovery programs, really trying to deviate from their former lifestyle, which is where the name for that restaurant comes from. And so actually seeing that and seeing their legacy and what they're doing has been nothing short of inspiring. And I just think there are so many stories worth sharing because these people have been through some really incredible journeys and they have some really important lessons learned. And I think that by seeing you know, the legacy that they're leaving, And the impact that that has is just, it really helps humanize this issue that I think can seem so large scale and kind of so, you know, out there and not like it's actually impacting us, but really it is. So I think just giving a voice to those people is really important. Wow. So dozens of people they're employing, giving them work, helping them find a way out of addiction. What what has been an observation of yours you've seen about these, you know, several dozen folks that have helped now? What What have you learned from talking to them? Yeah, I think a lot of them just share gratefulness. They are, you know, they just have this such gratitude for the second chance at life. And that's kind of what Deviate is, is it's a second chance employment model. And my parents work to develop that. And that is so important because, you know, we talk about we want people to get sober. We want them to redirect their lives. But If they don't have the opportunity to do that, I mean, what are they supposed to do? And a huge part of that is employment. So that's why providing that to people who want to do the work, who want to get sober is really, really important. So, I mean, they're really just grateful for the opportunity to prove themselves because they're, you know, absolutely capable of excellence as we all are. That is so powerful because I would imagine when your parents came across them or they met cross paths. These people were probably sitting at a pretty low point in their lives, and now they've got a daily mission, a daily thing to do, something, a you know, way to make money and, and improve upon their lives. That is fantastic. Rick, let me jump over to you on this one. How, how has legacy played a role in your life? I guess personally, you know, my my children, my family, you know, family and friends, you know, people who might be here after I pass. You know, that's where I've given a lot of time, talent, and treasure to. And I feel like that'll be part of my legacy. Also, you know, I think the professors and teachers out there where they're teaching the folks, you know, they're kind of leaving a legacy by, you know, teaching a student something new that they might not have known before. And even in my business with investment real estate, there's been a lot of properties and buildings that I've been involved in renovating and making communities better. And I kind of feel personally there's a you know a positive legacy there leaving things behind and then i guess kind of finally or maybe some of the not for profits that i've been involved in whether it's volunteering or in leadership roles trying to leave a legacy there and then of course the final one would be writing this book you know to my family and friends and to the world you know so many powerful thoughts in there about really at the end of the day Helping others, such a mm. such a great theme. Mm-hmm. Jean, what, what would you add to this conversation about legacy and how it plays a role in your life? I'm not sure there is much to add. I think Sam and Rick have done a, a great job of discussing the important aspects of the legacies in their works. Fair enough. Uh, so, I will just say that 
I got great values from my parents and that is their legacy to me. My teachers also gave me some great values and I hope to pass those on by showing them and my son and my students that it's possible to create and be happy, successful and being a force for good doing so. That is fantastic. You know, one of the other themes that we often hear about when it comes to our legacy is sort of finding our calling, what's important to us. Mm-hmm. And Rick, I want to go to start with you on this, but you know, how do you, how do you make that connection? How do we figure out what is important to us? Because sometimes we don't always make that connection. Yeah, no, writing this book and interviewing some remarkable people that I know in my life, I've come across some really great examples of that. And one story is actually titled Finding Finding Your Calling, the Kevin Longino story. And Kevin was basically near death with kidney disease. And then they got the call where he was able to get, there was a kidney donor and he was able to have a life-saving kidney transplant. And afterwards he healed, got better, and decided to go on a National Kidney Foundation walk, was kind of moved by some of the people that he met there that I talk about in the in the book. And then he started volunteering some more in the National Kidney Foundation and actually got on their board. And as we do this interview today, he is the CEO of the National Kidney Foundation. And he really has a calling for helping others with kidney disease. It's, it's a really amazing story. Wow. So in his case, it was a health scare that got him motivated and going out and that inspired him to meet some new folks and, and to learn their stories and see, wow, there's something I could really do to impact people out here. Mm-hmm. And he went, went ahead and did it. Mm-hmm. Uh, that is awesome. Yeah. Gina, I want to jump ahead to you on this one and go to how do we find this, this legacy? How do we own it and connect with it? And you know, do values, do values play a part or how can they play a part? They absolutely play a part. Values are an intrinsic part of figuring out what our calling and our legacy is supposed to be in life. I I have to thank my professional coaches for helping me reconnect with my values, which helped me connect with my calling, which helped me connect with the legacy that I want to build. One of the things they taught me is that we are all born and grow up with a set of core values. Some of them are given to us by the people around us. Some of them are just how we're hardwired. When alignment was, we tend to feel stuck. We feel depressed. We feel purposeless. And that's how I was feeling at the time that I decided to pursue professional coaching. But by working with the coach, I was able to reconnect with those values. I was able to reconnect with who I was as a person because we are defined by our values. That's how we identify ourselves to ourselves. And through that, I was able to realize the alignment between writing creatively, but writing about policy and how that that was congruent with my core values. Wow. So finding this alignment in your case, seeking help to do so, just like you did with writing a book, finding a coach to help you through that, getting that alignment and really setting yourself on a path that sounds to me like has has found much more meaning and, and value in your own life. So that is fantastic. Absolutely. You know, Sam, you talk a a bit about this theme in your book about alignment and realignment with our calling. And sometimes we don't always get there right away. So, you know, how do we, how do we make that alignment if we haven't found it yet? How have you found yourself or others do that? Similar to a lot of what Gene said, my dad actually went through a similar coming to terms with what his true calling was. And Gene mentioned values, and that was a big part of my parents' story and their journey in opening, deviate, and just coming to where they are. They, when they were early in their marriage, had very different values. You know, they were very focused on money and being successful and status. And they kind of take took a look at themselves after my dad went through recovery himself. So he has, you know, two decades of sobriety now. And they kind of realigned, they refigured out what they wanted to do, what mattered to them, and they adjusted. And similarly, there are different employees at Deviate and just different people I've met who might be going down this certain lifestyle of drug, alcohol, other substance use that, you know, want to revamp. They they realize that's not the direction they want to head in anymore. And I think just realizing that just because you're on one path does not mean that's the end of your story. You always have a second chance. You always have the opportunity to redirect, to, you know, deviate, hence the name. And I think just knowing that you have that power, knowing that you have that ability is really, really important. So just taking a second to figure out what you want and if you're on the track to get there is, you know, crucial. 
understanding your wants and needs and knowing that there's resources out there. Sometimes you might have to go out and find them, but they're not so far out of reach. And what a great thing your family is doing for the community and this opioid, this crisis that we continue to live in. You know, Rick, you had a story about people shifting their legacy because sometimes we don't always get it right the first time, right? Or maybe we want to evolve it over. Yeah, no, 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 in Sam's case, what was what, what what does that mean to you? Yeah, no, in, in my book, there's a number of in, inspiring chapters and stories of some really heartfelt personal stories with incredible lessons. And in one story and chapter, it's actually called Drinking and Drugs Destroy Dreams. I remember seeing that bumper sticker in high school, you know, like on the bus, like above the bus driver. And then, and then while faith helps build them up, you know, and one person in the the book is Jeff Grant. And Jeff Grant was out of control with alcohol and prescription opioid abuse. And he actually also committed a white collar crime while, you know, in this kind of state. And he ended up going to prison. And it's an amazing story his, his whole life. But through it, he got sober and found faith. And one of his first responsibilities was being able to set up chairs early in the morning at a 12-step program. And one morning when he was doing that, he had that moment where he felt like he needed to really change his life and help serving others. And since that time, he's been sober for 20 years started a white collar ministry has been happily married and has helped you know numerous other people do that and to your point you know was able to shift his life from a very bad path to now a very positive one so powerful and i i really appreciate that all these so many of these stories come back to when we go out and help others we have a greater recognition about kind of what's going on in the world and how mm -hmm. we might sort of bring value to the world and which of course is a test for our legacy. So Gene, I want to go to you on this one. You know, when you think about the value of legacy, how do you how do you tend to think about that? Right? Because right there's is it a scorecard? You know, how, how do you think about this? Speaking of scorecards, sometimes we chase titles, sometimes we chase salaries, but these are all things that our society tends to reward. And we forget sometimes that People will often no, are not going to remember what titles you had, what trophies you won, how much money you made. Remember you for what you were able to do for them or what light you brought into their lives for, for better or worse. And so for me, writing isn't just something that I do for fun creatively for myself. I want to be able to pass on and a message about stewardship of the planet, but I also want to encourage others to be able to pursue their creative passions and remember me for being one of the people that helped push them in the right direction. So many stories of inspiration here, of connecting with our values, of finding what's really meaningful to ourselves. And I bet you all learned a whole lot about that as you wrote these books and went through this experience of talking to so many others that what a, a beautiful story, not about collecting trophies, but really helping others, serving others. So I want to go back to everyone with these next couple of questions before we wrap up here. And Sam, I want to start with you here. So when you think about legacy, what hope do you what what hope do you have for your book to pass it? What legacy do you hope your book will pass on? Yeah, definitely. I think just opening readers' eyes to the fact that addiction doesn't discriminate. It affects everyone from every gender, every race, every age, every socioeconomic status, you know, and everything in between. And I think just Coming to realize that is the hope that I have for my book. And I think that by sharing stories of people from different backgrounds with different experiences will hopefully help accomplish that. Because in order to work toward a solution to this growing problem that we have, we need to understand it. We need to talk about it with honesty and transparency and really realize that, you know, this is not a them problem. It's not something that affects them. It's an us problem and it could affect any one of us. And so that's that's what I hope that my book accomplishes. That's I hope the message that it, it that gets across and that people kind of walk away realizing that. It can happen to any of us in any walk of life. What a I mean, sad, sad but true. Thank you for sharing that context. Rick, let me jump over to you with this one. What legacy do you hope your book will pass on for others? Well, even though I'm a, a big believer in formal education, sometimes some of the wisdom and timeless wisdom and lessons that are in my book aren't always taught in school. So I hope the book might 
make some people's lives better and they find the stories very interesting and it, it you know they take something away from it that maybe they might not have somebody who might be able to give them that wisdom in their lives that is beautiful. And what I really appreciate about that is it's sort of like how history was maintained from early on, right? It was through storytelling sure. and sharing stories yep. of things you learned along the way. Yep. And you're trying to do that in a much more modern form, which I love, but holding on to the beautiful old teal journal from your grandfather. Well, thank you. Really nice. Jean, what would you add to this story here? Speaking of stories, I hope people, one of the legacies I want to leave with this book is I hope people enjoy the story and are able to take a break from their day-to-day -day lives to enjoy it because then they'll remember it. And the other piece of the legacy is one of stewardship. So clearly the book is about what happens when we aren't good stewards of our planet. That's one legacy I hope the book leaves behind. But you can also be steward of an idea, right? Of a concept, of a creative enterprise. and to leave people with with this book and my story is that they too can get out there and create and do fun things with that creativity and share their knowledge in a way that nobody else has tried to do before. Be creative, go help others, help the planet be a, a healthier. And so many times when we write books, it, it gives us a chance to think, reflect, and, and really see, maybe change it ourselves that we want to connect to more, maybe finding our new legacy. Right. So what do you think you learned about yourself along the way, Rick? And, and how's the book journey changed you? Well, I think, you know, interviewing the people for the book and at times getting misty eyed and other times laughing and just learning more along the way was just such an incredible experience that was just so enjoyable. I also found that was kind of new from doing this like a little bit of a writing spirit, you know, somewhere where the words come to you to put down on the paper. Now, granted, all of us have re-edited our writing, you know, numerous times, but kind of finding that writing spirit was really special, really great. That is really great. And just for listeners out there, you know, good books are written. Great books are rewritten. I think that's <laughs> how the saying goes, Rick. So thank you for sharing that. Gene, what about you? How did that, how, how did the book help you think about things differently and learn, teach you about yourself? Well, John, writing this book really put me back in touch with who I am as a person. And that was an incredible experience. I certainly loved writing the book, even when it was hard. And I found myself reconnecting with my core values as I was writing the book. I, like I'm bringing my whole soul now, not just to my writing, but to my family to my colleagues, to my friends, and my general interactions with other people. And now I am really excited about the future, whereas before it just seemed like something that was coming and I didn't know quite what to do with it. Wow. So bringing your whole self to all aspects of your life, I think that's so beautiful. And that's what this creation journey can do for you in so many ways. I really appreciate that. Sam, what about yourself? Yeah. So I think what I kind of gained from all this or learned through it was this new sense of humility. So I mentioned earlier that kind of the big theme and what I'm trying to get across is that addiction doesn't discriminate. It can affect everyone. And I feel like I came into this very much with the posture of, you know, I know this, I believe this, I'm going to tell people about it. And through talking to people and interviewing people for my book, I myself had this whole experience of, oh my goodness, this even affects me in a in a different way that I had even gone into it. Like I thought I had completely revamped how I view addiction and how it affects people. But really I learned about myself and my own thoughts and kind of got to challenge some of my own perceptions through the process, which is what I want my readers to do. So I think that was a really humbling experience. Wow. So it got you to maybe be a little more flexible and open in some of the views you thought you had. That is brilliant. And having this, that's what's so great about these journeys. You get to interact with all these people that can challenge, confirm, or maybe help you rethink your thoughts. And it sounds like you all had that experience in some way, shape, or form. So one of my, I think, favorite questions is so many times when we go through this, we a book journey, writing a journey, this creation journey, we have these sort of unexpected positives. We meet new people. We discover these new things. You know, What was an unexpected positive for you, Gene? Why don't you start with this one? Sure, John. I, I think the best, you had mentioned community and certainly building a community in the course of writing this book was incredibly positive. But what I wasn't expecting is that now I am back in touch with people I had not been in touch with for years. And in some cases, particularly my teachers, decades. So writing this book gave me an opportunity to reach back out to them, not only to say thank you, but to bring them along in this book writing journey. 
And that's been an incredible gift. Wow. I think the record for my book was 20 years. Someone I hadn't talked to in 20 years kind of came back into my life through promoting it and talking about it on social media. That's fantastic. Isn't that fantastic? Yeah. Uh, so what about you, Sam? Yeah, I'd say honestly, a very similar thing is just community. I mean, writing a book, I have said it once, I'll say it again. There, I have a huge newfound respect for full-time authors because it is a full-time job. And I just had no idea how much went into it. And I am fully confident that I could not have done it without such amazing support. And I found that through New New Degree Press and everyone that's a part of that program, but also from all my supporters who, you know, pre-ordered and cheered me on and encouraged me. So I think really kind of feeling that community was hugely rewarding. And I expected it, but I really feel like I'm just so you know grateful for it. And people showed out in a way I, I couldn't have imagined. Right. We always say never write alone. And it means many things, right? Having an editor, having a community, having friends and family support you. And you said you have a lot of respect for full-time authors. I would argue through my book journey, I learned a lot of respect for people that write and do lots of other things at the same time, right? Because mm-hmm. you've got to fit this into your life and you all found a way to do that. And Certainly, last but not least, Rick, what what was an unexpected positive for you? Yeah, unexpected positive for me was the undescribable feeling and joy of sharing the book with my two children who are 20 and 17, and for them to come back and just tell me how much they enjoyed reading the book and how proud they were of me and how they wanted to share the book with other people is just just the most incredible feeling and such an incredible positive that I'm just so grateful for. How beautiful that the the gift that your grandfather gave you in writing this book came out of your own journey of putting this book together with your own kids. That's that's brilliant. Yeah, thank you. So key message, ladies and gentlemen, Sam, let me start with you. What's the key message the world's going to get from your book here? Yeah, it's that addiction doesn't discriminate. And in order to really fully understand that, in order to work toward a solution to the opioid epidemic, we've got to just start talking about it. It is time to stop sweeping it under the rug. It is time to stop denying it. So in order to deviate from denial, we really, really need to get that conversation going. And I hope that my book is the first step in doing that. Brilliant. Rick, let's go to you here, my friend. Key message. Yeah, with with lifelong learning and wisdom, you can just have a better life with less regrets. And you know, in the book, there's just so many interesting, enjoyable, easy to read stories that I think people can take a lot away from. And then my other hope is that at the end of the chapters with the open-ended questions, that some folks who are older that might be reading the book, they might be inspired to share some wisdom to some people that they care about, like my grandfather did with me. Lovely. Thank Jean, you. let's let's finish this one with you. Key message from Midgard. Well, again, it, it's fiction. So the message is implicit rather than explicit, and that is deliberate. But the message is be a force for good. We are at our best as individuals. We are at our best as a community if we all focus on being a force for good. When we lose that focus, that's when you see war. That's when you see conflict. That's when you see things like poor stewardship of our environment. Right. So many unbelievable, powerful teams here about helping others try to bring good to the world. And let's continue to learn and grow together. And I just keep hearing that theme throughout each of your stories. And I think approach things with an open mind because we don't always, we're not always all going to see things the same way. And mm-hmm. and that's okay sometimes. Mm-hmm. Uh, last question here, ladies and gentlemen, and I'll, Rick, I'll start with you. You know, what's next for you? What is your some of your big goals for 2022? Well, my my biggest goal is getting out there and and sharing the Teal Book of Wisdom with with folks, which, you know, after writing a book, you know, getting it out there to share with the world is a big undertaking. So uh, that that's my big goal for the rest of 2022. Get the book out there, let let them know. Gene, how about you? Most audacious goal for 2022. What's what's coming up for you? So my 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 book ends on a cliffhanger. And I want to build enough momentum and interest around this first book to be able to write the sequel. Love it. And Sam, bring us home. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I just moved to Columbia, South Carolina, and I'm a journalist here. So I want to continue telling stories, maybe not in the form of a book, but on TV. So continue to get to get the, to know the community here while also staying connected with my community back in Lexington, helping to support my parents' mission of giving second chances to people who need it. 
unbelievable stories, lessons, and messages here. And hopefully everyone and our listeners gets a chance to start to think about their own legacy and what they're leaving behind and how they can connect their values to that or think about connecting to their values to their legacy that they if maybe they haven't had done some work around that. And I find it fascinating that three completely different books have the power to do this through your various methods. And that really is the power of creation, right? There's no one way to get something done. So last but not least here, ladies and gentlemen, where can people learn more about you and your book? Jean, why don't you start this one? Yes. So I am an active member of LinkedIn. It's under my married name of Jean Godfrey. And then I am also on Instagram at Jean Hull underscore author. And Sam, why don't you go next? Yeah, my website is sam-perez.com and you can find the link to all my social media there. Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, it is Sam Perez News. And Rick, what about you? Yes, I have a website, Rick Roth, R-I-C-K-R-O-T-H, author.com. And I also recently got the Instagram and Twitter handles of Rick Roth Author, so I could be reached there too. That is outstanding. We have three amazing new books coming out this fall, September 2022, wherever you buy books online, Gene Hull Godfrey, Midgard, Sam Perez, Deviate from Denial, and Rick Roth, The Teal Book of Wisdom. Go out and get your copy wherever you get books online. I want to thank all three of you for joining me here today and sharing your incredible stories with the creator community. Thank you, Gene, Sam, and Rick. Thanks so much, John. Yeah, thank you so much, John. This has been an incredible opportunity, and I loved working with Sam and Rick. Yeah, and thank you, John, and likewise with Eugene and and Sam as well. Uh, It's truly been a pleasure. Thank you both. Thank you all for being on the show here. If you like this episode, don't forget to subscribe on your favorite podcast platform, YouTube, Apple, Spotify, wherever you like to consume podcasts out there. And if you want to learn about our cohort coming up with the Creator Institute this fall, go to creator.institute to learn more. I'm your host of the creator community, John Saunders. Keep creating.